Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today, we find ourselves in the Lord of the Rings universe, where one player will take on the role of Frodo and his companions, who are journeying from the Shire to Rivendell, while up to four other players will represent the Nazgul, who are trying to hunt down the Hobbits. Now while traveling, Frodo and others must resist being corrupted by the ring that he wears. Hunt for the Ring is a game of hidden movement, deduction, and adventure by Ares Games. It's played in two parts, with each part being played on a different game board. Even though both parts can be played in a long evening of play, we suggest you play each part in a separate session. Therefore, today, we'll be focusing on part one. So we'll be doing a rule school, where I'll teach you how to set up and play the game so that you don't have to read the rulebook yourself. Now I've placed timestamps below me in the description of this video, just in case you want to jump to a specific section of the rules. Well, let's get started. Hunt for the Ring is a two to five player hidden movement game where in part one, one player will play Frodo who will be traveling with the ring trying to escape, but the Nazgul players will try to stop him from getting to one of the three exits. Frodo will only have 16 movements to get there and the power of that ring can cause corruption, and if it ever maxes out, the Frodo player has lost. And Frodo will be keeping their movements secret behind a shield. Frodo will get help from company cards and ally cards, and the Nazgul will take actions from different dice and get help from sorcery cards. The Nazgul players will not only be moving, but using these dice as different actions, like the ring to use perception to narrow down where Frodo might be, or to hunt when they think they know where he is, and some shadows allow you to use any die. Hunt for the Ring is a cat and mouse style game that has deduction, cooperation, and is always tense. To set up, first select the single player. That will be the ring bearer trying to bring Frodo and his hobbit friends safely to the sanctuary of Rivendell, while the other one to four players will be playing as the ring wraith players leading the different Nazguls. The single ring bearer player, who I'll also refer to as Frodo or the Frodo player in this part one, will take the player's shield like this and they'll place it in front of them, unfold it with the green portion on the top. It's both on the right and the left and it's going to be the further one away from you like this. You'll also take the journey log that looks like this. This is double sided. You'll want to use the side that has sort of a green ring around it. You will take a piece of blank paper, fold it to size, and fit it through this and slide it in here so there's actually paper here. Paper is not included in the game, you'll just have to use some paper that you have. You'll then take that journey log and you'll put it right into the player shield just like that. So the players that are playing the Nazgul side cannot see any of this. You'll be sitting facing the board. This will allow you to see the same board that's out on the table, but you could see it without people seeing where your eyes are. Next, find the fellowship tokens that have this icon on them, and they're green. You're going to take three of those and place them on this corresponding spot on the journey log. There will be one left over after you do this, and you can remove this from the game and put it back in the box. Next, you'll find the three Frodo starting location tokens. They match this icon on the journey log. You're going to shuffle these up, and you'll take one of them, and you will place it face up right here on here. This shows you your starting location. The other ones can get returned to the box face down without any of the other players seeing it. Next, you're going to find the company cards. On one side, they look like this. First of all, you will take the one that says Strider and you're gonna remove it from the game, put it back in the box because that's only used in part two. Then you'll also take the one with ends in Brandy Buck and you'll take this one, you'll keep it close to play, but just off to the side. And these ones can be placed right in front of you. Next, you'll locate the ally decks. There's a green one and an orange one. Remove the orange one. That one is only used in part two. You can put it back in the box. For the green one, you'll shuffle up that deck and you'll draw three cards, place them in your hand that you can look at, but don't show them to other players. This makes your starting hand of ally cards. Next, take the game board and place it out in the middle of the table. Now, the board is double-sided. You'll want to make sure that you're using the side that has a green ring around it not orange, and also the numbers from zero going up has a green background and also has the numbers one, two, and three here on the left. That is the side you're using for part one. You'll also take the turn marker and place it in the first day action space here on the bottom left. This marker has a ring on one side and an eye on the other side. You want to put it ring side up in this spot here. You're then going to find this corruption marker and you're going to place it on the zero spot on the right side of the board. You're then going to find the Frodo figure. It's the one with the yellow base, and you're going to place it on the zero movement number in the upper left-hand side of the board. 
This is going to track Frodo's movements throughout the game. Next, you're going to find all of the information tokens that look like this, and it matches this icon here on your journey log. You're going to shuffle these up and take only five of these. The rest of them will go back in the box, but don't let anybody see what numbers are on the back of them. Now, the five tokens that you have after that will be face up on your shield. Don't let the other players see them. You'll be selecting one of these to give to the Ring Wraith players. Now, what these numbers mean is that if the Ring Wraith players are able to search on any of these locations that you'll keep, it will give them bonuses throughout the game. But if you're able to get there first, then it will stop them from getting bonuses from searching that location. So let's say I'm gonna give them the 25. These ones would just go here. Keep in mind that in a standard game, there will be one left over because you're only using four of these. This is not used in a standard game. The information token given to the Ring Wraith side will go face up on this Black Riders player aid. This will help track some special abilities throughout the game that we'll go over later. Next, the Ring Wraith players will divide up the Nazguls for the players on that side. The Lord of the Nazgul will not be used in part one and can be removed both the figure and the card and put back in the box. Regardless of the amount of players on the Ring Wraith side, all four of these Nazgul will be used. If you're the only player, you'll be moving all four of these. If there's two of you, split it evenly, two and two. And if there's three of you, each player will get one and then send the extra one to whichever player you like. If a player is controlling more than one Nazgul, that player will place the cards in a clockwise order to keep the order straight as to which order they will go throughout the game. You can also give these Nazgul tokens to each of the Nazgul players in conjunction with the color of their Nazgul. Gather all these log tokens and give them to the Ring Wraith players. They have a ring on one side and different things like this on the back side. There's a total of six of them. We'll go over how you use these later. Next, you'll shuffle this red sorcery deck and each Ring Wraith player draws one sorcery card from here to make their starting hand. Now keep in mind, if one player is controlling more than one Nazgul, they still only get one card because it's one card per player. Next, you're gonna locate the corruption tiles. They all have this on the backside and there's three different types. We have beige, red, and gray. The three gray ones you're going to remove from the game, they are not used in this part. The red ones, you're going to just set off to the side for now. There's two of those. And all the beige ones, you're going to shuffle up and put them with this side up so you can't see what's on the other side. I'm going to put them in a stack like this. Conversely, you could also throw these into a bag or some type of opaque item like a cup so that you can't see them. Next, you'll take this lead player token and give it to any one of the Ring Wraith players chosen at random. Starting with that lead player and going clockwise, all the Ring Wraith players will place their Nazgul on one of the six starting locations. They have this icon on them. The lead player will take the six Ring Wraith action dice, which are the black dice. This orange die is removed from the game. This is only used in part two. That lead player will then roll all six dice. Let's say this was the result. For each of the shadow results, which has this symbol, which matches the fellowship token, the ring bearer player will take one of those fellowship tokens from the fellowship pool we set up already and put it on the Frodo company card. You do that once for each shadow die that was rolled, knowing that there's only three of them to start the game in that pool. Next, set aside these ally tokens, company log tokens, and track tokens. You'll be using these later in the game, so keep them close by but kind of off to the side. The object of the game for the single ring bearer player is to move from their secret location on the board all the way to the exit on the other side of the board and do so within 16 movements or less. And they'll be able to exit any of these three lettered locations. If they can't escape within 16 moves, they can still win by being rescued, which essentially means you'll be close enough towards the end without your corruption going up. We'll go over more of that later. The Ring Wraith players win by corrupting Frodo up to a level of 12. The game is played over multiple rounds known as days. Each day has three different turns, two successive daylight turns, and then a nightfall turn where it gets a little bit more dicey for the ring bearer. Now in each turn, the ring bearer player will take a turn and then all the Nazgul will take a turn. This will continue to one of the three ways the game will end that I've already mentioned in the goal of the game. During a daylight turn, the first thing that happens is Frodo must move. When the ring bearer player moves, 
they will write in the specific place they're moving to in the next spot in ascending order. They have not moved yet because it's still their first movement. They had started on the location number one, and they would write in here. They will look at this map if they'd like to so that their eyes don't go on the board, and they can use this or the board itself. This journey log always stays behind the shield so that the other players can never see it. Now when moving, you can move to two different things. You can either move to a dot or a location. We start in location one secretly, and notice that all the starting locations, locations are numbers like this. All these locations, one space away is always one of these. This is known as a dot. This is known as being in the wilderness, traveling in between locations. So your first move here uh, is going to be a dot. So in this case, we could write a dot in the first movement, and anytime you make a move, you move that Frodo figure up to the move that it was. Now when you move to a dot, you will just simply make a dot in that spot. That was our first move. Now the ring bearer player can always mark a dot as the new move, keeping you in the wild, regardless of where your last location was, whether it was a dot or a location, and you can have as many dots in a row as you'd like. Now normally after you do a single move, it is going to go to the ring wraith's turn. After that ring wraith's turn, which we'll go over later, a possible encounter could happen, which we're going to go also over later, and then we would have advanced the turn marker. So let's go back to Frodo's turn, pretending it's his second turn, to show you what moving to a location looks like. Now if you remember, we placed a dot, but we started our last location was the number one. That's where we secretly started. Now anytime you're on a dot as your last move, your last location is where you came from. So in this case, we're still in number one theoretically, yet we're out in the wild, which means we're kind of virtually in any of these dots like this. So we could like move to a location four, saying that this was the dot we were in, we go to four. Maybe we could move to eight. Maybe we want to move to another dot. Uh, maybe we want to move to two, which will then allow us to get towards the 15. So let's do that. Our second move is we're going to move from our dot to location two. Now all the possible options I just talked about are what's called within reach. Now this is a key term we'll talk more about later, but in general within reach means a location which can be reached with Frodo's next move. What is in reach depends on your current location and the number of dots on your journey log. A location is within reach if it's adjacent, that is directly connected to your current location. For example, if you were in location number 15, Number 16 is directly connected to it, so it's adjacent, which also means it's within reach. It's also within reach if you're connected to Frodo's last location by a number of dots equal to or less than the number of dots marked on the journey log after the last location. So for example, if we were in location one as our last location and we had marked a dot, anything directly connected to that dot is also within reach. So all the spots that I had just previously showed you are within reach for this reason. And we would write it in right here, and anytime you move, remember to also move down the Frodo character on the board. It'll always be on the number that you've just moved to. Now we did that because we might want to move down here to 15, which would remove this token and give them less possible abilities, which we'll go over later. The Ring Bearer player starts with three ally cards, and these are cards that represent favorable events and characters that the Ring Bearer player may use to hinder the ring rates. Once per turn, the Ring Bearer player can take one of those Fellowship Tokens from the Frodo card and place it back into the pool in order to draw another ally card. You can never have more than five ally cards. If you do, you must discard down to five immediately, but you get to choose which one to discard. Some ally and company cards allow you to spend Fellowship Tokens to do desired effects, and this does not count as the single token that you can use to gain an ally card on your turn. The Ring Bearer player can play one of these ally cards per turn, and they can play it any time on their turn, and they'd carry out the text on the card. Some cards also have ores where you can do one thing or the other, and some of them are played out of turn to cancel effects that the Nazgul's might do. If the deck ever becomes exhausted, you do not shuffle discarded cards, and you do not get new cards ever into the deck. Once all the cards are gone, they're done for the game. And some of those ally cards can cause certain things to happen in certain areas or sections of the board. It can use these company log tokens to mark those sections or areas. Now, some of these ally cards will bring in ally tokens, sometimes in specific spots, like 28 or 32 for this example. It cannot be brought in a spot that has a Nazgul on it. Now, the Nazgul can never move through or onto a spot where there's an ally token. And some special sorcery cards will allow them to hunt or search, but they can never do those in these ally tokens. Think of these as protected locations. 
Some cards allow you to move an ally token to a connected location as long as there's not another ally token or a Nazgul in that location. And connected means it's either adjacent or only separated by dots. But if there's a Nazgul on a dot in between a location, the ally can move through it to the other location, assuming it's empty as previously described. There's only eight of these tokens available if they're all on the board and the player wants to bring one out, they can move one from somewhere else on the board. And if the Nazgul's end up taking out one of these allies tokens with a card, this goes back into the general supply, which can be brought back on the board later. You'll also have company cards, which have persistent events at the top, which you can use as described. They also have a powerful ability on the bottom, which will flip the card, making the persistent ability for that card no longer available. How these cards work will make more sense at the end of this video after you've learned most of the rules. Now we just simulated the second ring bearer's turn. It's actually the second daylight turn. In each of these, again, the ring bearer is gonna go first and then the ring wraith is going to go. So let's just pretend we're here in this second daylight turn. The ring bearer has gone and now we're gonna to go to the ring wraith's turns. The four Nazguls are going to get activated, starting with the lead player and then going clockwise around the table for those Nazgul players. And remembering if one player is running more than one of these Nazguls, they have already set the order clockwise at the beginning of the game. So the active Nazgul can both move and take an action, and they can do it in any order. They can move then take an action or take an action then move. Now by default, during a daylight turn, the Nazgul can move one adjacent space. And a space is either a dot or a location. They can also decide not to move if they so desire. Now when moving, you'll notice many of these have sort of a brown outline. These are all known as paths. You'll see some have a big white road. This is known as a road. And this is important because if a Nazgul player wants to move their Nazgul, completely on the road, they can move up to three adjacent spaces, as long as all three are in the road. And this is regardless of if it's a daylight turn or a nightfall turn, which we'll go over later. So let's say that red was the actually the active player. They could go one, two, three, because the entire movement was on this road. Otherwise, if it wasn't, they can only move the standard one. The Nazgul can never move onto or through any of the exit locations. There's other things that they can't move through, but we'll go over those later. Now the Nazguls never block movement from each other. You can move through or onto each other as well. Let's say this blue player was here and they ended up wanting to be exactly where this red player was. This is when you use the Nazgul tokens that we set aside and set up where you can put these tokens here so they can both be on the same spot at the same time. Also keep in mind that the Nazguls never block movement from the ring bearer, meaning the ring bearer, when they're moving in a secret fashion, can move through where Nazguls are and they can even land on where Nazguls are. But let's say the board looked like this. It's the red Nazgul's turn, and they've moved to this location of 51. Remember, before, after you move, or even if you don't move, you get one action. Now, there's one free action that could be the action you take, and it is to search. And how this works is this Nazgul will ask the ring bearer player, have you ever been to location number 51? And a search can only be done on a location. So the ring bearer player would look at their journey log and see if that number, in this case 51, is anywhere that they've located at any point during the game. In this case, obviously it's no, so they would just say no. Uh, if it was somewhere here, they would just say yes. Even if they're on the exact space that they're asking about, they just say yes. They do not say that they're on that space. Now, in addition to this, if any of these information tokens has the number that they asked about, in this case, 51 was the one they asked about. In addition to the normal answer, which by the way, has to be truthful, they take this and they're going to give it to the Nazgul player. That Nazgul player is gonna take that token and place it on the Black Rider card. Now how these Black Rider abilities work is instead of using your free action or instead of using the normal use of a die, you can use what's here to activate a specific ability. Now these are cumulative, meaning if you have two of them here, you could choose either of these. The lower you go and the more information you get, the more options that you have. But if during movement, the ring bearer moves to one of the locations, that one of these information tokens are face up and have the same number like this, they would then flip it down face down. And later on, if then any Nazgul player asks about that or searches that spot, they do not get that token. It hides information and stops them from gaining those powerful abilities. Now, if when searching they got a yes, they would take the track marker. These are the markers that have the sword on one side and an eye on the other side. And you would take that eye, because it's a search, you would use the eye side and you would place it there. That's to help mark that that search has been successful. 
and we know that the Ring Barrel player has been there at least once throughout the game. Now when searching, you can never search any of the three starting locations for the Ring Barrel player. And since this red Nazgul player was able to move and did their only action, which in this case was the free action search, their turn's over. It goes to the next clockwise sitting Nazgul that has not had a turn yet in this daylight turn. So let's say it's this purple Nazgul's players next. Since they're gonna stay on the road, they can move up to three. So they move up to three spaces just like that. There's nothing to search here, so they're gonna decide to do a different action. Now, if you remember during setup, these six dice were rolled here, and these can be used by the Nazgul players throughout the entire day. Now, keep in mind, an entire day are two daylight turns and a nightfall turn. Since there's four Nazguls, four times three are 12 actual turns that will be taken in one day. And there's only six dice, and once each of these get used, it gets removed for the rest of the day. So out of the 12 total actions in a day period, only six of them can be used as dice. So you must use these wisely. Now you're only able to take one action. Let's say they take this hand. This is a sorcery. Now look at this. This is the sorcery deck. Uh, everyone started with one of these cards at the beginning of the game. It matches what's on the die. When you use this die, you'll place it off to the side, knowing that it cannot be used again. This will either allow you to draw a sorcery card or play a sorcery card from your hand. Now you're only playing one of these, and I'm gonna show you a few of them just to give you ideas of what they do and when they're activated. Some of them have specific times that they can be activated. For example, this can only be played if Frodo is on step six or higher of the movement track. Early in the game, he's obviously not there yet. This one says you can only play during a nightfall turn, which is not now because we're in a daylight turn. Some of them say, you can play it in part two. This is part one that we're doing, so you would not use those. You'd use the spot that says any part. So the cards themselves are self-explanatory, and you'll understand them more once we go over more rules of the game. When you play that single card and it's used, it goes to a discard pile, and once this draw deck is completely gone, you would shuffle the discard pile to make a new sorcery deck. Now, if your Nazgul is in one of these darker red locations, then you could use any die as a sorcery die. And as I mentioned previously, that's either to draw or play a sorcery card. Now, remember that you're only doing one action on your turn. It would be the next Nazgul's player, but I'm going to go through the rest of the actions and tell you what they do. The ring allows you to do a perception. When you perform a perception, you're going to be asking the ring bearer if their last location is in a specific section or area. The board is laid out in with different sections. These sections are the different Roman numerals, and then you have areas which are different letters throughout the board. Sections always have borders that are double white lines. You can see this double white line going up like this. So everything around here and in here is section number three. Now there's also areas of these letters here, and these have these single white lines as the area uh, subdivision. So this right here, this entire region is known as area 3C. And the perception can only be done in the area or section that the Nazgul currently is. So that ring bearer player would look at their last location, which is always the last numbered location they've written down. In this case, it's early in the game, so it's two. So clearly the answer is no. However, if they were in one of the numbered locations that was in that area as their last location, they must truthfully say yes. If the Nazgul player gets a yes, they can use these Ring Wraith log tokens to help them take notes because they can't really take notes throughout the game. You can only do so using these tokens. For example, you might place a ring in an area, in this case, if there was a yes there that tells them that their last location was there. And they could take this single gem and place it on the movement track corresponding with that last move. So let's say it was later in the game, and they would put this next to the movement track of where that move was that they think the perception happened at. They can also use the other sides of these uh, for different things. You can use the crown to put in places that you think the ring bearer might be right now. And keep in mind when you use this perception, you're either doing a section, like this big section of three, or you're doing an area which is that subdivided area within a section. Now these two are identical. Those are known as shadow dice. Now the shadow dice, if you remember at the beginning when you rolled the dice at the beginning of the game, the ring bearer player got a fellowship token onto their Frodo card for each of those dice that were rolled and it matches that symbol that's in the middle there. Uh, that's because these dice are powerful and they're basically wild. They can be used as the ring, as a sorcery die we already showed, or as the last dice type that we haven't showed yet. You can spend one of these to be basically any of the dice. And we haven't showed you yet what the sword does and this allows you to hunt. 
The hunt is very similar to a search, but it's more powerful. Let's say that an active Nazgul player is the green one. They would activate that hunt and say, have you been to location 31 anytime during your journey? And a hunt may only be done in the location where that Nazgul currently is. And just like the search, the ring bearer player will look to see if that number is anywhere on their journey log. If no, they say no. If yes, they say yes. Now, if they had been to this location, but it's not their most recent location, they would just say yes, and the Nazgul player would take one of these tokens and they would place it sword side up because that was a hunt used by the sword die. However, if this location is not only on their journey log, but is actually the last location that the ring bearer is at, not only do they say yes, they also say Frodo is here and an encounter ensues. Now you would never bring out this journey log outside of the screen if you're the ring bearer player. I'm bringing it out here just to show you an example that if they hunted this location 31, Frodo was at 31, then they went to a dot in the wild and moved here. Their last location is where they're actually at. So when they asked about 31, that is truly where you are. Even though you're in the wild somewhere, you're still, this is your last location. So in this case, yes, they would say Frodo was here and an encounter would ensue after all of the Ring Wraith players have had their turn that round. When resolving an encounter, the Ring Barrel player will see how many Nazgul's are in the location that the hunt happened in and how many adjacent. Adjacent is a space that's connected to and is one space away. So right here we have two. If this Nazgul were here, it would still be two because even though it's in the wild, it's still one space away. So it is adjacent to where the hunt happened. Now, there are two total Nazgul here, so that's how many Corruption Tiles the Ring Barrel player will take. So here we've drawn the two Corruption Tokens. Now, at the beginning of the game, you got these Company Cards. Now they have abilities at the top that you can use throughout the game as the Ring Barrel player, but there's a special powerful ability that you can use at the bottom, and then you would flip this, meaning you'd no longer gain the ability that used to be on the top of this card. And some of these cards allow you to discard the effects of a drawn Corruption Tile. So you could flip one of these as the Ring Bearer player and discard one of these out of the game and not take it. And it looks like you have two of these right here that could do that. But only one company card can be flipped per encounter. Now, let's just say we did not want to use those. How is Corruption taken? Well, this one would be one Corruption. And an I means you get one Corruption. Then you look to see how many eyes are already near the board and you get that many corruption, here there's none, and at the end you move this one here like that. So if you had drawn two eyes like that, you'd get one corruption and it would move to the left, there's nothing here. You'd get one here and another one because there's one there and then this would get moved to the left. So that means the next time they start to chain together and become more corruption. Now clearly these are now next to the board, they do not get mixed back in with the stack. If there are any non-canceled ones that don't have eyes, like this one, they would get removed from play, they do not get shuffled back into that stack. Now if you remember at the beginning of the game, we removed the two corruption tokens that had red backgrounds. There is a sorcery card that's used by the Nazgul players uh, that could add a special corruption tile to the hunt pool. This would be shuffled into this stack here and be added to it, and if these are ever drawn, they cannot be used or removed by the use of these company cards to flip a corruption tile. At this point, you check the corruption track. If it's less than 12, the ring bearer will do an escape. Otherwise, if it is at 12, the ring bearer has lost the game. Now I've removed the Nazgul's from the board just to make this easier to show how an escape works. This was the place that the hunt happened in. Now to escape, the ring bearer player can either decide to move or not. Now I've brought the journey log from behind the screen just to illustrate this example. You'd never do this in a normal game, but this is where the last location was. When the ring bearer decides that they want to move, they can move to a spot that they are within reach to. Now, in normal terms, within reach means they are adjacent to a specific location. They were at 31, then they had a dot. Now, they're one space away from 26 and 32, so they're considered in reach by default terms to those right now. However, when escaping, you can move to a location within reach as if you had one bonus dot. So here I already have one dot, which means I could actually move within reach from up to two dots away from my last location. And as we see, number 29 is within reach of two dots from our last location, number 31. And keep in mind, you can never move through another location when escaping. So in this case, when escaping from 31, I could have went to 33, or 26, or 32, or 27, or 29. 
And if I did, I would write that new location in the next spot of my movement track. And also don't forget to move the Frodo figure up the movement track. Now, if you decided not to move, you would simply put a slash just like that. And still don't forget to move that Frodo figure up the movement track. The hunt die can also be used to remove an ally token that is adjacent to the current Nazgul. So for example, this gets here through different things like uh, ally cards from the uh, ring bearer player and a stop movement. So normally once these allies are here, the Nazgul cannot move onto or through this, but using this hunt, if it's adjacent, it can remove this from the board, opening up the location to move to or through. And once all the Nazguls have taken their turn, we would move this to the next turn, which is going to be a Nightfall turn, which has some things that are different from the Daylight turns. Now the flow of the turn works the same, but in the Ring Bearer's turn, they can either move or rest, where in the Daylight turns, they're forced to move. Now, if they decide to move, the Corruption Tractor moves up one. And if Frodo did move, you flip this over to the I side. Now, if you remember in the daylight turns, the Nazgul's for an action can use their free action to have a free search as their action. But now, since this is on the I side, this flips over and now they can actually hunt for their free action, which is more powerful in the search as previously stated. However, if Frodo decides to rest and not move, the movement tracker will not move up. This stays on the ring side and corruption does not move at all. And there's some company cards that will do specific things if you rest during the nightfall. Now, during the Nazgul movement in the Nightfall turns, if they use a path, they can move two instead of one. Normally, they would just be able to move one on a path, but because it's Nightfall, they could move two as long as they use a path. And if they had started here, they could still use two because as long as you use a path of one of your moves, you can move two, even though their second move was on a road. When you end the Nightfall turn, the first thing that will happen is the Ring Bearer player will draw one ally card. The lead Ring Wraith player will pass the lead player token to the next clockwise Nazgul player. Unless, of course, they're the only player moving all of the Nazguls. That lead player then draws one sorcery card and then rolls all of the dice. Keep in mind that, again, each of these shadows will get one fellowship token to the Frodo player from the pool onto their Frodo card. And then this goes back to the first daylight turn and we start all over again. Part 1 continues until one of three things happens. Either Frodo gets to one of the three lettered exits, and if so, they make it to Part 2. If the Corruption gets all the way to 12, then Frodo has lost the game and you do not go on to Part 2. Or if Frodo has taken his 16th movement, Part 1 ends immediately and you'll go on to see if he's been rescued. The Frodo player would then count how many movements would it take to get to the closest exit from where their last location was at the end of Part 1. For example, if they had gone to 61 and their last movement on 16 was a dot, they are just one movement away from the closest exit. If they were at 52 and their last movement, their 16th was a dot, they would be 1, 2, 3, 4, or 3, 4. Either way, four of them. Whatever that is, you draw that many corruption tiles from the stack. Now the tiles drawn would be resolved just as normal as we talked about during the encounter. Now you can still use any of the company cards that you could still flip over to cancel the effects of some of these corruption as mentioned previously. Keeping in mind, only one company card can be flipped at this point. If the corruption tracker has not gotten to the 12, then Frodo has been rescued and wins the game. But if it does get to 12, then Frodo has lost the game and the Ring Wraith players have won. Now if you'd like to play part two in a separate gaming session, you now must put some things in this nice envelope that's given to you inside of the game. And the components you'll put in there are any unspent fellowship tokens, any company cards not flipped, and any ally cards in the hands of the Frodo player. All of the sorcery cards that are in the hands of the Ring Wraith players. You'll take the draw deck and keep it separate from the discard deck of the rest of the sorcery cards. It's best to put them like this so you can see which ones are draw deck, which ones are discard. You'll place these back in the box. Any information tokens found by the Ring Wraiths. Any discarded corruption tiles any special corruption tiles that were put in play, any eye corruption tiles that were next to the board, and any fear of the barrel weight sorcery cards would also go in that envelope. And when you're ready to play part two, go to the link in the description of this video for part two's video and you'll learn how to set up. If playing with players of different experience levels, you may want to change the setup to balance the game. If you want to make it harder on the Frodo player, instead of just giving one of these information tokens to the Nazgul players at the beginning of the game, they would give a second one as well, leaving only three here for Frodo. 
However, if you want to make it easier for Frodo, you would actually give them five of these, giving none of them to the Nazgul's at the beginning of the game. And if you want to make it even easier for Frodo, you can give them a fourth fellowship token. Well, I hope this helped you dive right into part one of Hunt for the Ring and get to the fun quicker than you normally would if you had to read the rulebook yourself. Now, if you have further questions about the rules, I've placed a link below me in the description of this video, and that's the best place to ask them, because not only will I be notified, but so will Ares Games.